everyone for coming along. Um, so I'll um, kick off um, the talk today with a um, with a quote. So, man is a creature who walks in two worlds and traces upon the walls of his cave the wonders and the nightmare experiences of his spiritual pilgrimage. And that's by the Australian writer Morris West. And um, that's where we got the title from for this project, Walking in Two Worlds. So um, tonight's talk by Julian is a part of this much larger project. Um, Walking Two Worlds really is um, an artistic exploration into the primitive, the mysterious, the shamanistic, and the knitting together the fragmented pieces of ancient and more recent narratives. Initially programmed to be a part of last year's Beat Painting Biennial, it was to be a touring painting exhibition, starting off at Swansea Museum, traveling up to Gallery in Carnarvon, North Wales, then going over to Ocean to Park Gallery um, in Manchester, then making its way down to Folkestone as a part of the Folkestone Triennial. Um, the exhibitions, which will now hopefully take place later this year and going into next year, revolve around the story of the person who you, who you will learn about tonight and, and involves contemporary artists who I felt had some sort of spiritual connection to her. The name Hetty Van Coten was introduced to me in 2016 when Julian exhibited at Elysium Gallery and a random conversation brought up this strange shadowy figure. What interested me was her um, apparent strange connection to the ancient cave sites she had explored in the south of France and her claiming to be under the influence and control of the ancient energies that latched onto her from them. There was also the mysterious fragmented nature of her life story. It was like trying to piece together a jigsaw with three quarters of the pieces missing. She always seemed just tantalizingly slightly out of reach. And so it is Julian who has been trying to pull together her story. There is something intriguing and seductive about these prehistoric cave sites that preoccupied Van Coten. Most of the art was created at a time when humans were not at the top of the food chain. Our, connect, our connection to the landscape and the environment around and above us helped keep us alive and fed into storytelling and rituals long faded into history. We can now only try and pick at the few scraps we have and guess at the mindsets of our long ago ancestors. Interest in the ancient world, I think, is growing. There is a longing to reach back to a time before the modern world began to take root and corrupt us. We almost sugarcoat this time into a sort of new age, hippie human race in harmony with nature era, when in reality, it was probably a very brutal time and that we are a species born out of a history of extreme violence. Human history and stories are usually written by the winners, by the few who could communicate through writing. And so we only have the ghost imprints of extinct civilizations, cultures and languages to help put together an even partial overview of our human story. What we think we know is probably wrong. We constantly adjust its history to romanticize an era and its cultures and its historical icons, even in the more recent decades. So through our traditional mediums of paint, drawing and sculpture, walking in two worlds, I hope, will be an ongoing project that will explore and prod at the narratives that guide us. Um, we've just set up a, an Instagram page um, for, for walking in two worlds, and that's at walking in two worlds. So please sign up for that and we'll be posting stuff about all the projects and activities which will evolve over time. Okay, so I will hand you over to Julian. Okay, Hetty Van Coten. Well, Hetty isn't a lost great artist for a start. Um, she's not a second Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, I don't think a re-evaluation of her work is going to change the course of art history. She's very obscure. Um, she never made it to Wikipedia, but I think she does deserve at least a footnote of history. Um, her own story has its unusual aspects, uh, but in, in many ways, her career trajectory is all too familiar. There's a sort of a lot of obscurity, a brief moment of near recognition, and then 
it sort of fizzles out. Um, I think she's a lot of, like a lot of artists, really, and in many ways, I think she's a genuine article, and I think she's possibly unjustly neglected. The quality of her surviving output, or that which we know about, is patchy. Much of it seems a bit unfinished, and not necessarily in a modernist sense. It's almost as though she sometimes became distracted while making the work. Um, nevertheless, both her work and her life have haunted me ever since I came across her. Here's another, another early piece by her. I often buy old exhibition catalogues if they're going cheap, and I first found, found out about Hetty from a catalogue that I found in Hall's Bookshop in Tunbridge Wells, which is near where I live. Um, it, was, it was an old catalogue for a show called Primitives and Mystics, 20th Century Outsider Art, and it was held at somewhere called the Brandenburg Gallery in Clifford Street. I managed to find a picture of it, in fact. I think it's closed down now. In Clifford Street in London. In, inside the catalogue, there was a little snippet of Hetty's biography. Um, and what drew my attention was that she found inspiration in prehistoric cave art, which I think is unusual amongst primitive artists, certainly the ones that were sharing the catalogue with her. Cave art's long been a, an obsession of mine, too. Uh, I went down the Fond de Gome cave in France about 30 years ago. I have to say I'm not normally moved by art in the way that one might be by, say, music. Um, but going down that cave was an exception. It was an extremely moving experience. If, if you've never been down a painted cave, I'd strongly recommend it. So that's one of the paintings in the Fond de Gome. So apologies for this rather bad reproduction. It's actually a, a scan from the catalogue itself and it hasn't come across too well. Um, but it was, it was the illustration to Hetty's work and it differed from everything else in the catalogue. Um, the label primitive when applied to artists often implies a sort of combination of eccentricity and extremely meticulous attention to detail. And Hetty's work wasn't like that at all. It was free, possibly even wild. And I tried to find out a little bit more about her. It proved quite difficult. She wasn't in any of the dictionaries of art that I could find, and there was nothing online. I wasted a whole day going up to the v &A to look in the library there and without finding anything. Um, Later, I, it suddenly occurred to me that I hadn't looked in the bibliography in the catalogue that I bought. And there it was at the back. There was a short article by um, uh, somebody called Simon Abbott, who was a bit of an art historian, I believe. Um, and he'd written in an obscure art magazine called Scraffito, uh, which was prevalent in the 1970s and 80s and then kind of disappeared after a brief run. So that it, it turned out that the, um, the bequest, if you like, or the, or the work that, that Hetty had left behind her at the end of her life, found its way into a museum in Toulouse called the Musée Urbain Vitry. Um, there aren't many places in Toulouse that could put on this sort of show. So I did a process of um, elimination to find this place. Um, they, they were donated the work and they didn't know what to do with it, essentially. So this often happens in museums, I believe. Um, so her oeuvre spent most of its time in the basement in the, um, the gallery. But there was talk of doing an exhibition uh, sometime in 1987, I believe it was, um, in the museum, but it, it, it never came off, apparently. Anyway... I've been in touch with the museum. I haven't been able to visit it because of COVID, but they have been incredibly helpful in being prepared to loan us some of her work. Um, and it's Hetty's work that we're hoping to show in the, in the show that Jonathan was talking about in combination with um, work from the artists who are participating. So who, who was Hetty Van Koten? Well, there is a short piece of film very short piece of film, 
which survives. I think somebody took it on a, an amateur camera sometime in the 1950s. And that was pretty much it. Um, to the next slide. So her early life, well, as the name suggests, she was Dutch. She was born Henrietta Margareta van Koten at Verd near Sertogenbush in uh, 1908. Her parents were Joris and Margareta van Koten. They ran a small farm, the Duck Decoy. To give some indication of their level of poverty, Hetty was the youngest of eight children, but only the only one to survive to adulthood. Her name appeared on the local roll of the school, uh, the, the local school between 1919 and 1921. Apart from that, we know absolutely nothing of her childhood. 15, she went into service as many young peasant girls did at the time, and she was sent to Breda, became a maidservant to the elderly and rather rich uh, Rachel Cohn Tavares. Um, when Tavares moved to Paris, Hetty went with them. Now, to be an understatement to say that she was dazzled by the bright lights, she left service very quickly. Uh, I don't think she enjoyed being, um, being a housemaid and became a cabaret dancer. Now, she turned out to be very successful as a dancer. By 1927, so she was about 20 at that time, um, she was appearing on the bill at the Casino de Paris, one of the leading clubs in Paris. Now, it was there that she, she met Olivier Roger. Now, Roger was a notorious playboy. He was a, a bad poet and even worse novelist and a, basically a dilettante. Um, and they, they ran off together. Now, it turned out, unfortunately, that um, Roger was also a close relative of Hetty's former employer. Um, so the, the, this, this elopement was by no means popular. And in fact, the, um, the family brought a lot of pressure on um, Roger to give, the, give up this dalliance. And the way they got out of it, was to pay Hetty off. Um, Roger and Hetty moved to Vere in the lot in, in southern France. Um, but he was then given a sizable sum of money in order to, 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 to get out of the relationship. And Hetty was given an annuity for life in order to keep her quiet. So here we have this young woman from a Dutch peasant background, um, briefly tasted the bright lights of Paris. And she now finds herself in this tiny village in a rather mountainous region of France. Now it was, it was there that she met Amade Lamosi. Uh, Lamosi, he was a, a priest. He was the local priest in the village next to there uh, called Cabaret. Now I suspect his job as a priest wasn't all that onerous because he also became a celebrated and indeed internationally renowned archaeologist, although still remaining an amateur. Now Lamosi was keen on recruiting volunteers uh, in order to, um, to carry out his archaeological uh, explorations. Um, and two or three of the volunteers that he enlisted discovered a cave complex at Peshmerl in 1922. This is five years before Hetty would have arrived in there. Now Peshmerl is one of the most famous cave sites. And it was, it, the teenagers really found it by accident. Th th this is a photograph of Andre David. He was, uh, he was one of the three. Um, and of course, being small and being um, rather more wiry than uh, the Namadela Mosey, they were able to go down into these caves 
and um, there they found the paintings. Now the the Peshmerol caves are rather remarkable. There are bears, horses, mammoths, bison, and unusually there are also human figures on the walls. Some of the paintings go back to 25,000 years. They're one of the most arche important archaeological finds ever made. These things weren't quite so greatly appreciated back in the 1920s, and for a long time it was down to amateurs such as the Mosey to study and look after them. Amongst the small army of helpers that he recruited from the local population uh, was, was Hetty. This is the most famous painting in the, in the Peshmer cave, the spotted horses. For a long time, it was thought that the, um, the, the spotting on the horses was rather fanciful, but it, it turns out, I think uh, paleontologists have worked out that the horses at that time really did look like this. Uh, you also note the, um, the handprints on the walls. These were made by, by spitting pigment over the hand and creating, creating a sort of um, negative print. This is a drawing of the horses by Hetty, which was, was in fact published. Um, it turned out that Hetty had quite a talent for, for not only for drawing, but also for discerning the images on the walls. Um, and she made quite a few drawings for Limosi. Um, some of them appear in his published papers. This one, I think, was published in L'Illustration. Um, back in about 1928, something like that. And that's a hand print. Now, in 1929, the, an, an event happened in Hetty's life which rather transformed her and transformed everything around her. The details are not at all clear, but it seems that while she was working in the cave, she suffered some sort of psychotic episodes, some sort of vision um, that left her in a great a, a situation of great distress. Um, so much so that Father Lamosi um, felt that she needed to be institutionalized. In fact, she spent a short time in the asylum in Fijek. Uh, she was there for two weeks. Um, when she was finally returned home, she was put in the care of Camus Noiré, the local physician. And Noiré was also a follower of Freud, and he was profoundly interested in, um, in Hetty's case and in her hallucinations. And in fact, we, we owe most, or certainly a lot of what we know about Hetty um, from Camille's own um, own auto, autobiography, his own notes, um, which he sort of privately published, um, rather indiscreetly, I think, because he wrote about quite a few of his patients, and Hetty was one of them. Um, now, Hetty's hallucinations continued after she was, while she was under Noiré's care, and Noiré had the notion of getting her to paint or draw what what she was seeing as a form of therapy. And when he did this, he said that in his memoirs, he said that this was like a dam had burst and it was, it was the beginning of Hetty's life as an artist. And these are one of her images from that time. It's, it has a remarkable resemblance to one of the handprints in the cave. This is another one. There's, there's almost a sense of automatic drawing about this, um, it, sort of in the surrealist sense. But, you know, some people say they can read a cave into this as well. And this is one of her earlier attempts um, using, uh, using oil paint uh, on canvas. And it's, it's, it's got a very sort of stygian, very underground sort of feeling about it. Now, you, you can see that Limosi had some rather 
specialized tastes. Um, here he is sorting out some bones from in his little museum. He set up a museum at Peshmerl. And you, you can see on the walls all the finds from the uh, from the cave. Now there's an art, the art historian Simon Abbott, who I mentioned earlier, he, um, there's a, a rather nice quote from him where he sort of explained what was going on with the visions. He said, the visions continued, these were Hetty's visions, but painting enabled Hetty to take some control over them. And as time went on, she developed an elaborate mystical explanation for the origin of her work. She claimed that while she was working at Peshmerl, she'd been suffused with a spiritual energy emanating from the cave itself. And she identified this as the same energy that had inhabited and inspired the original Orinacian painting painters. Ironically, she never entered the cave again. And indeed, Lemosi um, discouraged her from ever going down the cave. He was unsettled by the, um, the, 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 the psychosis that she'd suffered down there. And he, he forbade her from going down the caves. They, they remained on good terms, however. And not long after this, war came, 1939. Um, and for those who don't follow, or haven't followed the more recent history of France very closely, essentially the country was divided into two and the, the occupying forces occupied the northern part of France, um, and in the south, a, a republic called the Vichy Republic was set up. The, the little red arrow you can see at the bottom shows you where Vere is. Now, this this left Hetty in a rather difficult situation because after the fall of of Holland, the um, the, the annuities that came from the Cohen Tavares family. Uh, dried up very quickly. Um, not only that, but Hetty was now a foreigner um, in a country that was very suspicious of foreigners. And it was only with the support of her friends that she really managed to survive, uh, especially Noiré and Le Mosey. Um, even so, in 1942, she very, very narrowly escaped being deported into forced labour in Germany, again through um, Father Lemose's uh, intervention. Now, apart from her sketchbooks, the only real glimpse we have of Hetty's wartime existence was found among her possessions. Uh, it was a travel permit from 1942, which authorized the journey to Bordeaux. Um, as you'll see, Bordeaux fell outside the, the Vichy zone and it was in the occupied zone. And no one has the faintest idea why she wanted to make that journey. The past describes her as a, as a dressmaker, I believe. Um, so there was some sort of subterfuge there, but it's rather futile to speculate really what, um, what was going on, whether there was some sort of resistance activity she was involved in or, or what was happening. So we're, we're left dangling with that. Um, artistically, she was quite prolific at this time. She produced lots of notebooks, um, lots of drawings, e even though it was difficult to get hold of materials. She became interested in the anatomy of animals and plants. And she left behind her a, quite a collection of books on zoology and botany. But the interest was always from a particular point of view. And that point of view was to do with the interior spaces of things. Um, she seemed to relate the internal workings of animals and plants to the, the cave systems that she'd, she'd worked in before. So here's an illustration from one of the books that she, um, that she owned. Uh, again, this, this fascination with, um, with innards. And one of her paintings from the time which again is, is somewhere between the sort of biological biomorphic form and, and a geological one. And here's a diagram of the Peshmerl caves. You can see the, um, see the kind of connection between the two.
she she was continued to continue to be supported by Dr. Noire um, in her creative life after the war. Um, he he still saw it as therapy, but he did appreciate that it did have a strong aesthetic component as well. He could see that she had some talent. And through his own personal connections in Paris, he um, he managed to get some of her work into a, an exhibition of primitive art at a, a gallery in Paris called the Gallery Fronzac in 1953. Now, it so happened that Jean Dubuffet um, visited the exhibition and afterwards he, he wrote her a letter expressing his enthusiasm for her work and um, inviting her to meet him in Paris. Now, Dubuffet was the founder of a, I'm not sure we call it a movement exactly, but he was a founder of um, Art Brew, as he called it, which was um, essentially the work of outsiders, people outside the norms of the art world, such as children, criminal, criminals, and um, the mentally ill. And he, he bought a couple of pieces of Hetty's work from the exhibition for his own personal collection. In fact, there's now a Dubuffet, um, uh, foundation which um, which has the, the bulk of his collection in it. This is one of the um, the painting from one of the primitives that he collected, um, Adolf Wolfley, uh, who was, I believe, uh, in an insane asylum um, and produced this work, which it occurred to me, it looked remarkably like to be a fame self, if you look at the little figure inside there. But perhaps I'm just imagining that. And this is one of Dubuffet's paintings from slightly later, from the later 1950s. Um, again, he is trying to challenge this, um, this sense of the primitive, uh, despite being a rather more, um, rather more tutored painter. Here's Dubuffet playing the nose flute. Um, now, Noire accompanied Hetty to Paris for her first meeting with Dubuffet. And in her, his memoirs, he, um, he recalled how Dubuffet entertained his dinner guests by playing rather obscure musical instruments, uh, for which he was quite well known. Um, he apparently started on the accordion and then moved on to the bagpipes. Hetty felt at home with Dubuffet's avant-garde circle at first, and she, she moved to Paris permanently, much against Moiré's advice. Moiré was uh, very concerned that she'd lose her, her connection with her hallucinations and with her ability to, to, to handle them. So she rented a small studio and was soon hanging out with writers such as Georges Bataille, uh, Michel Tapier, and, and André Masson, the artist. Um, this is Georges Bataille down a cave, as it happens. Uh, I can't help wondering whether it was it was Hetty's influence that, uh, that that's encouraged him to uh, to make this particular expedition. So these are some of her Paris period paintings. Um, as you can see, she's getting slightly more ambitious, um, slightly more refined, perhaps not entirely in a good way. Um, as Noiré feared, um, it did take a toll on Hetty's fragile mental state attempting to work in Paris. The way from there, her vision started to diminish um, as they got less and less frequent. Um, because they were the stimulus for her painting, uh, she was no longer able to work so well, or indeed work at all. Um, she started to be plagued by depression. She started to drink. She had a series of unfortunate love affairs. And finally, the work having dried up entirely, um, Noire persuaded her to return to there. Now, this is clearly a posed um, photograph. Um, Hetty didn't normally paint on canvases that size. Um, but I think this was all the part of sort of being dragged into the art scene in, uh, in Paris. That you, you had to kind of publicize yourself. So she only spent three years in Paris in this sort of final phase. 
Um, and then she left in 1956 and returned to there. Once there, she was able to paint again. Perhaps the late work is, is rather more self-conscious than the earlier work. Um, I think she's a bit tainted now by the sophistication of Paris, by notion of academic painting and so on. Certainly the work's a lot darker. I mean, this canvas, one of her last ones is, uh, is, is a rather gloomy one. Um, she led a very solitary life um, in the last, last, uh, last years in, in Vere. And she was pretty much forgotten as an artist. And then a strange thing happened in 1958 when she disappeared. Neighbours saw her walking along the road. Um, there were one or two eyewitnesses uh, in, 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 in the direction of Cabaret um, and in, in possibly in the direction of the, uh, the Peshmal Caves early one evening. It was reported to the police. Um, various extensive searches were made, uh, but no trace of it was ever found. Um, after a few years, uh, she was declared dead in absentia. And it was at that point that the large hoard of paintings in her, in her cottage was, was claimed for the, um, the museum in Toulouse. Um, and that is about as much as we know about Hetty Van Coten. To lose yourself, to find yourself. So there we are.